Hi there. Welcome back to the last of this week's episode of 5 or 10 or 15 minute physics. Uh, today I want to talk about virtual particles for uh, two, a bunch of reasons. One, I may use them in subsequent discussions, but also because virtual particles are the, seem so weird that, and mystical that they make most people think that physics is kind of mystical and not that different than, than, uh, than mystical things. And, but in fact, Virtual particles are required to exist and do exist in nature, and they are, it turns out they're required to exist because of the two central pillars of 20th century physics, quantum mechanics and special relativity. When you put them together, virtual particles pop out of the theory just like they, they basically pop out of, of, of real space, as I'll show you. And, and I want to I wanna show you why. Um, so let, let's get there. The first reason has to do with the central premise of, uh, of qu quantum mechanics, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And, I, and yesterday, I gave you one of the examples of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. The chain, if, if I measure the uncertainty in energy times the uncertainty of t in time in any measurement I make is better, b bigger than a, it turns out h over 4 pi, if I put everything in right, although that number doesn't really matter. This was the r relationship I showed you yesterday. Um, there's another more famous Heisenberg uncertainty principle relation that says that if I measure a particle over a certain distance and I only know its accuracy of its position to a certain distance, the mul and I, then I, there's an uncertainty in its momentum, which is and the product of those two is also bigger than h over four pi. So it says if I measure if I if the uncertainty in the position of a particle is very small, so I know where it is, the uncertainty in the momentum is very big. Okay. Now, by the way, this is really profound. I don't think there's ever before been a any theory that gave a fundamental limit on what we could possibly know. Before this, what you measured just depended upon how good your measuring apparatus was. Now, it's a fundamental law of physics that you cannot measure these two quantities better than a certain amount. And it's a property that nature exhibits. And it's central to quantum mechanics. Um, it's probably the most, perhaps the most central bit of quantum mechanics that produces its weirdness. Now, so that's quantum mechanics. Now, relativity. Well, relativity has many weird predictions uh, for time and space, but one of them has to do with simultaneity, and it is the following. If I have two points in space, and say lightning strikes those two different points in space, two different observers can measure the relative time between these events differently. Say observer A, say I'm standing still here, and I measure this event happening before that event. Observer B, moving very fast relative to me, could look at those events and say, no, this event happened before that event. And that's possible. Now, that sounds crazy because it appears to violate causality. Because after all, if this is the cause of this event for me, how can this observer view the effect happened before the cause? And that's crazy. But there's a kind of cosmic catch-22. And that is that, that, that shows that it works out. Because two different observers can only disagree about the relative ordering of two points, two events in time, can only disagree about which happened before the other, if those two events happen separated in space by an amount which is greater, is so large, that, that no object can travel from here to here, no object traveling at the speed of light or less can travel from here to here uh, in a time that is less than the time difference between those two events. So what that means is, since they're separated so since since nothing can travel faster than light, this event could never be the cause of that event if the time difference between them is smaller than the time it would take light to travel between them. And that means this event can never be the cause of this event, this event can never be the cause of this event, and that means the relative ordering in time only changes for events separated so, so far in space that, that uh, cause and effect are, are, are not screwed up. But that's only true because all objects travel with a velocity less than light. But what if an object were traveling faster than light? Well, if an object were traveling faster than light, then it'd be possible that this observer would see this event happen before that event, this observer would see that event happening before this event, but if they're moving faster in, in, than light, it turns out they would see a change in ordering even for events in which one event was the cause and the other event was the effect. So this observer could see the effect happen before the cause, which is crazy. 
How can we reconcile that? Well, in principle, it is crazy. But one way to reconcile it is to say, effectively, this observer is moving backwards in time. So it turns out, if there were observers move, that if particles could move faster than light, then for me, standing at rest, I would be observing this observer as traveling backwards in time. Its clock would be traveling backwards. And that's why we don't see such particles, or at least the theory doesn't include them. Actually, they're theoretically possible in principle, um, if they, as long as they never slow down to less than the speed of light. They're called tachyons, and you would have heard of them in, say, Star Trek. They're all the time in Star Trek. But we know no th good theory of tachyons, and we don't see these things happen. For as far as we're concerned, all all objects travel less than or equal to the speed of light for a whole bunch of reasons in relativity. But it turns out when you combine these two things together, virtual particles are required to exist. Now, the first theory that combined quantum mechanics and, and, and special relativity was a theory developed by Dirac, a guy named Dirac. And in that theory, it turned out, mathematically, particles called antiparticles were predicted and virtual particles were predicted. Dirac never believed either, uh, until, in fact, they were both shown to be true. But Feynman later came up with an argument, a physical argument, that I kind of like, that shows how these two things together imply the existence of virtual particles. So let me try and show it to you. Let me um, draw uh, a diagram here. Uh, uh, where uh, So I consider a particle moving in space and time. So this is space, and this is time. It's called a space-time diagram, the kind of thing Feynman used to use. And um, so, um, so let's say a particle... Now, what the Heisenberg uncertainty principle tells us is really that there are uncertainties in the momentum of a particle if I, if I only... For, or if it, over very short distances, particles can be traveling with various momenta. And in fact, one of the central rules of quantum mechanics really is that it's kind of like the White House. If... Uh, if you don't see it, anything goes. And if you measure a particle and it, over very short periods, so short short distances that you can't see them, um, particles can be speeding up. And in principle, particles can be traveling faster than light if their momentum is large enough. Now, um, we, we can't see that happen, but, the, but in quantum mechanics, anything that's possible is happening, even if we can't see it. So if we think of a particle moving in a tra along a trajectory, moving at some speed... It can momentarily be traveling suddenly start traveling faster than light, which would mean it would move, move backwards in time. And then it could slow down and be moving again forwards in time and then, and then go on its normal trajectory. So this, for over this very short time, space interval, so short I couldn't even measure it, say, if I'm not measuring it, over that time the particle can be doing crazy things, and this is one possibility. Let's say it's an electron moving along. Here's an electron moving forward in time, electron moving backwards in time, and then electron moving forwards in time, and then, and then it's back on the old trajectory that I saw. So for that very short period, the particle can do strange and crazy things. Okay. But this is really crazy looking, but let's, let's think about what happens when an electron is moving backwards in time. And a negative electric charge is moving backwards in time. But that is equivalent to a positive electric charge moving forward in time, if we follow the flow of charge. And so, let's think about what that would look like, say, on different time slices. So, um, uh, let's just start this particle back here. So, at this time slice, I just have this, just one electron moving forward in time. But suddenly, in this time slice, what do I have? I have an electron moving forward in time, and then I have a positron and an electron suddenly out of nowhere. At this point in space, what does it look like happened? It looks like a positron-electron pair got created out of nothing. So during this period, I have the original particle plus this pair of particles. But at this point, the positron annihilates with the initial electron. So from this point on, I just have the, orig the original electron. And then later on, when I'm observing it, I still have the original electron back. So during this very short time interval, I have particle-antiparticle pairs that are popping into existence that didn't exist before. And that's the virtual particle. Not only the, does it require the existence of antiparticles, but allows for the existence of particle-antiparticle pairs to pop into existence as long as they annihilate on such a short time scale 
that I don't screw things up and later on when I measure it, I have the original particle. Now that sounds crazy. It sounds like counting angels on the head of a pin when we say there are particles you can't see that are popping in and out of existence. But as I've described before, even though we can't see them, we can actually know they exist. For example, if I have a hydrogen atom, I know this looks like a cow, but if I take a positive proton there and a negative electron there, I can determine using the, using the laws of quantum mechanics the orbital levels of that electron around the hydrogen atom. And I can calculate them in quantum mechanics. And uh, the transitions between these orbitals produce emissions and absorptions of light called the spectrum of that atom. And I can predict in quantum mechanics the spectrum of hydrogen. But if virtual particle-antiparticle pairs can suddenly pop in and out of existence and then annihilate, then what can happen? Well, for a while, a positron-electron pair can pop into existence. The electron is going to want to hang around near the proton. The positron, which is uh, positively charged, is going to be repelled. And for a while, this will change the charge distribution near the nucleus of an atom. And that will change if you, the, the energy spacing of electrons and orbitals around that atom. It'll change it by an amount we can calculate. And in fact... We can do the calculation, and what's amazing is we can do the measurement. It'll change the frequencies of light emitted by this atom by an own amount. And the comparison between theory and experiment can be done now to almost 14 decimal places. And when we do that, we get agreement between the frequencies predicted and observed to that level. It is the best measurement in all of physics, the best the best measurement and the best agreement between fundamental theory and observation anywhere. And we wouldn't get that agreement if we didn't include these virtual particle-antiparticle pairs. In fact, this being able to do this calculation is one of the things that Feynman first did, one of the things that won him the Nobel Prize. So virtual particles allow us to get the best predictions in all of physics. And I find that amazing when you think about it, that the most precise predictions in all of physics are due to particles we can never see, but we know are there. That's amazing to me. So I hope uh, that's the it for virtual particles and it for, for uh, five to 15 minute physics. It's just a little over 10 minutes now um, uh, for the week. And I hope you have a great weekend pondering virtual particles and stay safe. Take care.